And now, another timely and powerful message from Pastor Emmanuel Williams and Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she might be delivered. Verse 7 reads, And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, mm -hmm, and laid him in a manger. Why did she lay him in a manger? Because there was no room in the inn. She didn't lay him in a manger, wrapped him in swaddling clothing because she was poor. Unlike what I was taught growing up. I was taught it's because there was no room in the inn. They had money for the inn. But because Mary was pregnant, riding on a horse for 80 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem, they arrived late. So everybody got the rooms filled. The rooms got filled. Amen. It's like the football game. People, uh, people, um, Confirm their room, how, how you say it? Reserved their rooms, right? A year before. Mm? A year before you come into reserve a room in August, you won't get a room. Are you with me? That's what happened here. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, so it was that, verse 6, they are referring to Joseph and Mary. Mm -hmm. Amen? And the him they are referring to is Jesus Christ. Yes. And so what I want to do this morning is spend some time just talking about the birth of Jesus and the events surrounding his birth. And of course learn the lessons so we can be encouraged from the lessons and the events surrounding Jesus' birth. Luke chapter 2, we're in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. We didn't read verse 1 to 5, but let me just tell you what verse 1 to 5 is about. Verse 1 to 5 records that while Mary was pregnant... She and Joseph took an 80 to 100 mile trip on a donkey. Now tell me how fast can you go on a donkey with almost nine months being pregnant? Mm? They're going to go very slow. And back then sometimes she had to get off the donkey to give the donkey a break. Because he or wouldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> he always not a camel. <laughs> so it took them a little while. Praise God. So she a hundred and eighty mile trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Why? Because of a decree issued by Caesar Augustus. Caesar is a title used for Roman emperors, much as we use the title president today. So you have President Bush, mm -hmm. President Clinton, mm -hmm. then Caesar, you have Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar. So it's a, it's a, 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 a title used back then by the Romans. Caesar, the Caesar we're talking about here, his name was Augustus. They call him Augustus, but his real name was Gaius Octavi Octavius. Gaius Octavius. And he succeeded. Uh, that's just history. Let, let, let's move on here. That's not that important. What's important here is uh, the aim for the decree was greed. Caesar, Augustus, or Gaius Octavius issued a decree to enroll or take a list of all the citizens to find the employments and the amount of property they had. He was after money. However, when Gaius Octavius issued that decree, God used that decree issued by an ungodly ruler now, are you with me? By an ungodly ruler to, to draw Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to fulfill a prophecy given seven to eight hundred years before Jesus was born. A prophecy by a prophet called Micah. 
They call Micah a minor prophet. I'm here to tell you, there is nothing minor about Micah. The reason why they call them minor and major prophets is because of the length of the book. Are you getting me, brothers and sisters? When, when a prophet in a country in the backwoods prophesy almost 800 years that the Savior of the world is going to be born in Bethlehem, I present to you, this is not a minor prophet. Amen. Not only that, it came to pass. Amen. And let me just say while I'm on this year, you know, many prophecies were made for the, for the election. None of them came to pass. Amen. And so we have to hold these people accountable for lying to us. Yes. Spiritual leaders, are you with me? We cannot let our spiritual... Uh, let me move on here because I tell you, my Christian life is precious to me. Amen, are you with me? And so if you open your mouth and say, thus save the Lord, you better show. Amen. It is thus save the Lord. Because Micah prophesied 800 years under the inspiration of the... Let's go to it. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Let's see what this, this backcountry preacher in the woods. Amen. The one that, the one that theologians know it is called Minor. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? They call him Minor. But there was nothing Minor about him. Glory be to God. He says, but thou Bethlehem, Ephrata. Though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Israel. There is a semicolon. He's going to elaborate. He's talking about the ruler that's coming. He said, the ruler who's going forth has been of old. And he's going to elaborate what he means of old. From everlasting. That ruler that's coming forth, he's been around from eternity. That's what he's saying. Are you with me? He's saying that ruler didn't just, he wasn't born yesterday. Huh? That's why, I, I, I think is it, it's, what's the scripture? It says, for unto us, is it, is it Isaiah 7 something? For unto us a son... You, 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 you got to see that. A son is given, but a baby is born. Uh, <laughs> are you with me? God gave his son, but he had to be born into the earth as a child. But that son existed a long time before. And God just gave him. Oh, God. It's right here. Yes, thank you, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a what? A child. A child is born. Yes, children are born into the earth. Unto us a what? A son. Yes, sir. Somebody's son was given to us. And that's God's son, the beloved. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Glory be to Jesus. And it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. They were, hey, what Jesus said, tell that old fox. Amen. Caesar, tell that old fox. They were after him. Yeah. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Wonderful. His name shall be also called? Counsel. counsel. Anybody any counsel? Yes. Yes. Counsel? <laughs> oh, glory be to Jesus. I think it's Proverbs chapter 21. You don't have to turn there. Verse 30, it says, it says that there is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. No counsel against you need counsel. Glory be to Jesus. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Son, the child is called what? The everlasting Father. And he's also called what? Yes, that son that's given. So Mary and Joseph took a trip, 80 miles, 80 to 100 miles, and they're going. 95 degree weather pregnant with Jesus but a word came from the Lord <laughs> Woo! 800 years before that day and brothers and sisters we are told in Isaiah God said my so shall my word be it shall never return for let's go to Isaiah chapter I think is it uh, 55 11 somewhere around here I think Isaiah 55. Let us see what the Bible. So 
shall my word be that what goeth out of my mouth it went out of Micah's mouth 700 years before that debt so shall my word be the prophet prophesied the word it shall what not return unto me void but it shall what accomplish can you go further okay we haven't got the rest amen that's okay but we got, it shall accomplish that which what that which I please and it shall what prosper in the thing where I sent it to so that's what God said about his word so if you're a prophet and you say thus saith the Lord it's not going to return void if it returns void meaning if it doesn't happen something is wrong and it's not the Lord are you with me so Isaiah spoke Isaiah said so shall my word be that get out of my mouth God's word came from Micah's mouth 800 years and because because the prophet said that the Savior is going to be born in Bethlehem because it was from God it doesn't matter where they were they had to end up in Bethlehem because because the Bible says God's word does not return void right. I think it sums uh, what's the sum that says I have magnified my word above Psalms 138 verse 2 can I go to Psalms 138 verse 2 it says the, the, the last part of it Psalms 138 verse 2 I think if memory serves me right bear with me since some of these I have I've memorized a long time ago I'm just trying to pull them out Psalms 1 theory. yes it says for thou hast magnified thy word above what all not thy name all so God's word is above Jehovah Jireh it's above Jehovah Nisi God's word is above Jehovah Makadesh it's above Jehovah Roha Jehovah Rohai God's word is above that so God's word came from Micah's mouth and because God's word does not return void and because God's word is above his name it doesn't matter where Mary and Joseph were they had to find themselves where the word said the king of kings would be born yes. and so a ruler motivated by greed Lord have mercy are you with me after money the more he gets the more he wants he came up with a decree and he says everybody who's in Nazareth has to come up to Bethlehem to register and guess who was in Nazareth Joseph and Mary glory be to Jesus because the word said that the king of kings had to be born in Bethlehem and so that's where verse 6 starts are you with me saints and it was a long introduction but I love it when everything just come together how many of you love it when God's word just dovetail yes. amen so because it's it, it is God it is God and God said his word shall never return void let me ask you have you got have you gotten a word from the Lord yes. have you gotten a prophecy from God yes. it'll come to pass amen. yes it'll come to pass without a shadow of a doubt it'll come to pass Praise the Lord. It will what? Come to, come to pass. Now let me say, let me put a caveat in there. It'll come to pass if you cooperate. Yeah. Let me say that again. It'll come to pass if you, Mary and Joseph could have refused to go to Bethlehem and they would end up in jail. Because Octavius Gaius doesn't play. The Romans were harsh. If they say you got to be somewhere, you got to be somewhere. And if not, they lock you down. How many of you know of lockdown in Optimus Prime? <laughs> the Romans were worse than lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you haven't seen. I, I know because Emmanuel had me sit with him <laughs> to, <laughs> to watch lockdown. <laughs> when it came out amen the Romans they don't play so you have a choice to cooperate the Bible says in Philippians 3 don't turn there it says for we are laborers together we are what laborers together God's will in your life doesn't overtake you like a seizure well <laughs> you know I know I'm coming I'm coming against a lot of religion I know that because we were brought up saying what well, if God has for me it is for me yes right sing that song <laughs> what God has for me it is. 
the caveat is in there if I cooperate. <laughs> You know how long I waited? You know how long I waited? They told me that. I waited for 10 years until a preacher looked at me in the face and said, you are so stupid. That's what he said to me. Nowadays, you're going to tell Christians that they are so sensitive. <laughs> if you tell a Christian that they're not coming back to church. <laughs> but he said, he said to me, who told you so? Why are you so stupid? Why are you so silly, Manuel? And he told me, we are laborers together. He said, you, God has done his part. He said, it is finished. He said, you are not doing what you're supposed to do. Right. And that is why nothing is happening to you. Yeah. And he said to me, there are two words in G-O-D. Go do. Mm, and he said, listen to Nike. Just do it. <laughs> I am telling you what somebody said to me 15, 20 years ago. And I was singing, what God has for me, it is for me. You're one. What God, you're two. It is. You're three. You're four. You're five. What, at the end of your five, I said, God, what's going on? I thought they said, what? I never heard nothing. Still. <laughs> and guess what? Some of us are still, you're 25. <laughs> let, let, let me say, <laughs> because you know what? We are like Caleb. Give me the pill at 85. I don't want nothing at 85. You hear me? I want it now. Let me say it again. I don't want anything at 85. Now, if you want to wait like Caleb, congratulations. <laughs> I, uh, to each his own. But I want it when? Now. Yeah. So I'm going to cooperate with God when? Now. And I have to keep in mind that there's a process. Don't get frustrated in the process. Amen? Uh, let me continue here. I came to talk about the Christmas story. Amen? So the prophet gave a word and the Bible says that Mary and Joseph living in Nazareth at the time had to find their way to Bethlehem because they have to submit to the word. God, I give you praise. Since we got a book full of words and we are still looking for prophecy from a human being. Everything has been prophesied here to us. Oh, people love the gift of prophecy. I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet. So what? Tell me how that helps me with paying my bills. Oh. <laughs> I, I got 66 books of words. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me move on here. You see, I came up Christian. I came up the hard way in Christian in Christendom. You see, I was first a janitor. Then I became a musician. Then I became ordained as a trustee. Then a deacon. After I became a deacon, I became a minister. Then I became an elder. After years. Now some people just start and they get catapulted from the back to the front. That never happened to me. Are you with me, saints? Listen, I was not that fortunate. <laughs> Anyhow. Glory be to Jesus. So let, let's, let, let's see what how the prophecy unfolded amen so we are told micah 5 2 that uh, and notice what i want to bring this to your attention notice what the bible says in micah 5 2 the word bethlehem means what house of bread amen because the area was a grain producing region in the old testament times so bethlehem means house of bread notice the word attached to bethlehem ephrathah Ephrathah means fruitful and it differentiates it from a, Gali from a Ga Galilean city. There was a, there was a city in Galilee named the same thing. So God said it's not Bethlehem in Galilee, it's Bethlehem Ephrathah. That's where he's going to be. And Jesus ended up in Bethlehem, being born in Bethlehem Ephrathah. Bethlehem, Bethlehem fruitful. Amen? That's how exact God's word is. So verse 6 says, let, let's move on quickly. Verse 6 says, so while they, Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem, what happened? The Bible says, she brought forth her firstborn son, amen, and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him. Think about it. The God creator of the earth entered the earth. And it seems like nothing happened in the natural realm. Just an ordinary day. Everybody went on their way. Are you with me? 
In the natural realm, it seems like everything is all right. Just another day. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Luke presented this most amazing event in an understated manner. The most profound event in the history of the world, other than the crucifixion and the resurrection, is described by Luke in straightforward, understated means. In an honest, 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God became flesh. 1 Timothy chapter what? 3 verse 16 says, God was manifested in the flesh. It just happened. No fireworks in Times Square. You would think if God get entrance into the earth, there would be fireworks. Nothing. Ordinary day. Quiet. Born in obscurity. God was what? Manifested in the flesh. God showed up. That's what manifest means. God showed up. God was manifested in the flesh. I mean, we're, talking, we're talking about the creator of the universe came. Reduced himself to a baby. Helpless in obscurity. No fireworks at all. <laughs> uh, think about it. Joseph and, Mary, Joseph and Mary away from their friends. She couldn't even get a baby shower. No pamper. You, <laughs> you, you know what they do sometimes during the baby shower? They have a, a pamper wrapped up. <laughs> it looks so pretty. Jesus did not even have that. <laughs> oh, man, I said wow to that. I said wow because it tells me a lot. Tells me a lot. Think about it. What makes it even more humbling is verse 7 tells us where he was born and what he wore when he was born. Think of verse 7. Let's look at what verse 7 says. Verse 7 says, and she brought forth the firstborn. By the way, when the Bible says firstborn, it's indicating that Mary had other sons. The Catholics keep calling her Virgin Mary. <laughs> Are you with me, saints? She was a virgin until Jesus was born. Jesus had six other siblings, but they wouldn't tell you that. Well, let me move on here. So f I believe God put firstborn here uh, um, uh, uh, just as a, a way to tell the Catholics, hey, she's not God. Yes, she had to be respected. Amen? But uh, 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 perpetual virginity is out of the question. Well, let's move on here. The Bible says she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. The word swaddling here means, uh, it comes from a Greek word meaning to tear. Which means that swaddling clothes, that's uh, torn strips of cloth wrapped around Jesus' little body. So while they were, in, they were in an animal cave, the Bible said she laid him in a manger. The word manger means to feed. He was in a feeding trough. How many of you know what a feeding trough look like? I don't know if you know, but you know, back home I had, I had, we had a lot of hogs. And we used to take a tire and cut it all the way around in the center. Amen? And then that would be a trough. I would take a, a banana, boil, and just put it in that for the hogs to eat. Jesus was placed in one like that. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's a lesson for you and I, brothers and sisters. Mm. Wrapped around with strips of clothing. So Mary, she had some, uh, you know, they, they, they walked with additional clothing. And what they would do is maybe she took off one of her clothing and tear it out. And wrap Jesus' little body in there. And the world around is keep, keeps going on. Nothing happened in natural realm. No, you know. By the way, the title of my sermon is. In God's economy. God's projects never start with a big bang. God's projects never start with a big bang. I know science said there was a big bang and life came out of nothing. But if you read the 66 books in the Bible, you will see over and over again, God's projects never start with a big bang. Whether it's an individual life, whether it's a church, amen, 
Are you with me, saints? It never starts with a big bang. It's always in obscurity. Always in, it's always in humble beginnings. What matters to God is when you're at the house, what you do. Because I cannot see you. Nobody can see you, but God sees. That's what matters to God. How you spend your time. That's why the Bible says God looks on the heart. Not on the flashy, external. That's why with God everything is done in obscurity. And then at the right time, Psalm 75 verse 6, promotion comes not from east or west or south, but God, he takes you and he, based on what you do in obscurity. That's how God works. And for some reason, in the 21st century, we still haven't gotten it. God likes things well baked. He likes it well done. And for some reason, humans cannot understand that. God is not a showboat. God could have hovered, hovered over Bethlehem. Amen? He could have hovered and a, a whirlwind could have come and, mm -hmm, and set up shop and just speak a castle into existence. Are you with me? But that's not necessary. That's not necessary. God is not a showboat. He's not on a quest to impress anyone. He's not insecure. It is okay to be born in an animal cave. It's okay. You know why? It's okay to be born in an animal cave where there is no electricity. To be laid in a feeding trough. It is alright. Because it does not define who you are. <laughs> where, you, where you were born does not define who you are. It doesn't define who you are. He's still the king of kings and the lord of lords. He's still a mighty warrior. One day, every knee is still going to bow. And every tongue is still going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even though he was born in an animal cave. Even though he was wrapped with swaddling clothes. Are you with me? Since? Even if nobody was there but animals. The only people who were in the cave were Joseph and Mary and the animals looking. Yeah. That's our savior. Are you sure? I feel like eating him. No. <laughs> they, they knew it was their creator. Looking at him, a baby. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a blessing, saints? Let me ask you this morning. Do you feel overlooked, insecure, in obscurity? You feel you're not given your worth. You're not recognized as should. If you are, you're in good company. Jesus didn't get that either. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel like I'm overlooked, I should be further. Hmm? Why, am I, why, why am I not further in life? What's going on? That's okay. If you hang in there with God, He'll make you a big bang. <laughs> oh, glory be to Jesus. You don't, if your motive is to, to be a big bang, it won't work. But if you hang in there with Jesus, you don't have a choice but to be a big bang. Because Himself is a big bang. Even if He doesn't start that way, He always ends up that way. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Amen. Think about it, saints. You, you think about it. Uh, 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 how did the nation of Israel begin? How did the 12 patriarchs come into existence? This is how it happened. God spoke to one man in obscurity. He was worshiping, Mo he, he, was, he, he was an idol worshiper, Abram. In Mesopotamia, in obscurity, nobody knew, there was no voice. Abram, I'm God. No. <laughs> Everything is done in obscurity, hidden, so everything, so people can be matured into their calling. Are you with me? What, what, what about, what about uh, generations later, upon the exodus from Egypt, the Red Sea divided to make a highway for approximately 13 million people. 
How did that happen? The waters of the Red Sea congealed, stood up like walls. How did that happen? God spoke to one man in the backside of the desert, Moses. The Bible said Moses was content to live with uh, um, Zipporah's father. What's his name again? Jethro. Moses gave up on his calling. He was, for years, he's in the wilderness asking God, God, give me a second chance. I know I was called to leave Israel out of Egypt, but I blew it. Give me a second chance. And nothing. For 40 years, it took 40 years to break Moses. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It took 40 years to break Moses. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? You see Egyptians, the pharaohs who taught to be gods and people were beneath them. That's how Moses was brought up. You see people beneath them. They call the pharaohs gods. It took 40 years to get that way of thinking out of Moses. Because he was third in line to the throne of Pharaoh. So he was taught that people are beneath you. They are nothing. It took 40 years to break him. But he broke, and I thank God for it. I found out many of us are not broken. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. You know what I'm talking about. Have you seen a horse, just a horse, a black stallion? Nobody can ride me. Nobody can. And it, it walks around, it jumps around with pump. You all know what I'm talking about, right? I had a pastor friend. I had a pastor friend and he said to me, uh, um, his friends were moving out of town. They had a black stallion and, and they were about to put it down because the black stallion, nobody could ride it. It was never ridden. Two guys tried riding it and the black stallion broke their backs. So they knew he loved horses and they said to him, why don't you come over and get that horse? And um, he said, tell me about it. And they said, they call that, they call, they call that horse El Shaddai more than enough. That horse was more than enough. And he said the way he broke the horse is the horse would, it would come close enough to eat. But it wouldn't let anybody come close to it to ride. So he fed, he placed a rope around the feeding. I think he had a bucket and he covered it with grass. Hmm? And he hid beneath a tree. And El Shaddai stuck his head into the bucket. And when he stuck his head into the bucket, he didn't, he didn't see the rope beneath the grass. He, and the guy pulled the cord and El Shaddai got caught. And the preacher said, Past, I never saw a horse behave that way. He said the horse took off running and the, the rope was strong, was strong. The horse took off running. It flipped over on its back, fell on its back, and it got up and blood started coming out of his nose. And he said, I looked and something was coming out at the rear end. He said to me, he said, I've never seen that in my life. He said they called the horse El Shaddai, but at that time, that horse was a demon. And he said to me, this is, what he, this is what he said to me. He said to me, finally, the horse leaned on the rope and choked itself. I'm telling you how difficult it is for some of us to break. That's how some of us are. God is trying to break us, but we are fighting. And so the horse leaned and choked. And then he came, he placed his feet on the head of the horse, took off the rope and resuscitated the horse. The horse came back alive. From that time, everything changed. It finally broke. He said he would come close to the horse. And when he came close to the horse, it would just shake. Because it was broken. Now anybody could ride the horse. Saints, I'm telling you that because it takes a while sometimes for God to break, horse, to break us. Amen. It takes a while for God to break us. Sometimes it takes a while for us to listen to God and follow God. It takes a beating sometimes. It why, does it, why does that happen? You think about it. Why does that happen to us? You don't have to answer. I'll tell you why. It's because we have what is called free will. The best thing given to us is free will. The worst thing given to us is free will. Uh, no amens at all. That's all right. 
that's all right, that's okay, that's okay. But this is what I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, and I'll be done shortly. The Bible says that the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord like the rivers of water. The king's heart, Gaius' heart was in God's hand, and he used Gaius' greed to ensure that the word came to pass. And I'm saying this because many of us, we have leaders at work, supervisors, and we've been praying, God, can you make a way for me? Can you touch my supervisor's heart? Yes, he can. God just showed us he can, he can turn the heart. He can take, and let me be very careful when I say turn the heart, because God respects free will. But God can take the decisions that leaders make and use it to fulfill his word. Are you with me, saints? God is that wise. Amen? Glory be to Jesus. So, like I stated, the genesis of every divine mission was planted in obscurity, in silence, overlooked, ignored. Amen? So if that's you this Christmas, if you're feeling like there is no help, don't you worry. There is help. Amen? Amen. No, no family is there. Don't you worry. Jesus, there was no family there for Jesus also. No friends there for Jesus. What I'm saying is nothing is wrong with you if that's where you are. Today, the world lets you think that something is wrong, but nothing is wrong with you. How many of you were born in a feeding trough? None of you. In a feeding trough? In an animal cave? Oh, I was about to say. <laughs> I was about to say. In a, none of you here were born in an animal cave. None of you here were born in a feeding trough. Everybody here, when you were born, you had pampers on. Jesus didn't have that. He didn't have that luxury. And yet, he was the king of kings and the lord of lords. Yet, every one of us here, one day, will say Jesus is lord and will bow. Your identity is not tied in who you are or where you were born, who you belong to, whether you live uptown or downtown. Are you with me, saints? Our identity is tied in Jesus Christ. Oh, and the quicker you learn that, the better it is for you. And this is what I love. Of everybody God could have told, Jesus was born. He went to lowly shepherds. Are you getting what I'm saying, saints? I'm trying to. He went to lowly shepherds who were abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flocks at night. Can you go to verse 9? Verse 9, all of a sudden, brothers and sisters, when Jesus was born, it seems like nothing was happening in the natural realm. But in the spirit, there was a praise break. Are you with me? A praise break. The Bible says in verse 9, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Upon the end, upon the shepherds came upon means they were not expecting him you see the i'll tell you a little bit about shepherds in a while do you know egyptians called shep they were abominations to egyptians you remembered when joseph told his brothers when pharaoh asked you what do you do tell them you are tell them you <laughs> you forgot the scripture okay okay that's your homework Find out what? And then he told him, because they are abominations to the Egyptians. That's why they put them away from the Egyptians. Because they look down upon shepherds of everybody else. Hmm? Normally, listen since normally the birth of a prince would be announced to kings and other dignitaries. Amen? <laughs> but this princely announcement was given to lowly, and lowly shepherds. Not to priests, not to the rulers, not to the high priests, not to the kings, not to the Pharisees, or the scribes, or the Sadducees, not to the great men of Israel, but to common shepherds. Who was a class, listen what one commentator said, the shepherds were a class, a, a, a class actually considered as outcast by the Jewish hierarchy. Shepherds were near the bottom of the social ladder. They were uneducated and unskilled. Increasingly viewed in the post-New Testament era as dishonest, unreliable, disreputable. So much so that they were not allowed to testify in the courthouse. 
Because sheep required care seven days a week, shepherds were unable to fully comply with the man-made Sabbath regulations developed by the Pharisees. As a result, they were viewed as being in continual violation of the re religious laws. And hence, they considered them ceremonially unclean. However, <laughs> ceremonially unclean, but not so with God. However, God still chose. Still chose. Amen. To tell the greatest news, apart from the resurrection and the crucifixion, to lowly shepherds. That's what I'm saying. God loves people who are humble. Amen. He loves humble people because God knows the world, the, the world and and. and I have to say this right here. The world and, the, and those who are rich externally. Because brothers and sisters, God's, way of, God's perception of richness is different from our perception. Right. Let me say that again. God's perception of which of being rich is different from our perception. God looks at you being rich in the spirit. Amen. Psalms in, in Genesis chapter 39. Joseph was on the auction block. You don't have to turn there. <laughs> Joseph was on the auction block, about to be sold, naked. And the Bible says God was with him and he was rich. A slave, about to be sold, naked. And the Holy Spirit saw him as heaven saw him. And God said he was rich. <laughs> Are you with me? God looked at Mary and he said, highly favored. He looked at Gideon and he said, mighty man of valor. Are you with me, saying? So our perception of riches, of being rich, is different from God's perception. Because God looks on the heart. Typically, those who are externally rich are very proud. They haven't got time for God. Guess where they are today? Guess where they are today? On the beach. In a boat. St. George Island. Guess why? They feel they don't need God. Because the Bible says money, and Ecclesiastes is right, it says money answers all things. You and I can't, listen to me saints, this is the Bible and God is right. Mm -hmm. Money does answer a lot of things. It cannot cure <laughs> miraculously, but it can buy some good cancer medication. Amen? Cancer. Yeah, cancer. Thank you. I mean cancer. Are you with me? Yes. But are you with me? But money cannot give you a miracle. Yes. It cannot give you a, a spiritual miracle. Are you with me, saints? And so that is why God chooses over and over and over and over to share the good news with people who are humble. And if there is anything you and I need to learn while I close during this Christmas season is remain humble. Do not complain. Are you with me? God is always in small beginnings. Humble beginnings. right. And you and I, we need to know how the kingdom of God works, brothers and sisters. We need to understand that God works in obscurity. God never starts with a big bang. You need, to, you need to understand that. But if you hang in there with God, like that donkey Jesus rode down on Palm Sunday, when they were clapping for Jesus, they were clapping for the donkey also. Are you with me, saints? You just hang in there with Jesus. Day by day. Doing the right thing every day. I got to spend time with my master. I got, I got to set aside time to pray. I got to set aside time to read the word of God. Are you with me, saints? Because when you pray and when you read, it is showing your dependence on God. Rich folks externally haven't got time to pray. No, what they do is that's called a lawyer. You get what I'm saying? Let's call a lawyer. Amen. But you and I, we need to find where the house of the Lord is. Amen. Glory be to Because not that we don't believe in money. We know whose we are. And we know that our Redeemer lives. Are you with me? We know that he's the King of Kings. And he is the only one that can take you out. Are you hear? God is the only one who can take you out of some of the trouble we are in. Amen. Because some of the things we were in, the devil has us in there. And brothers and sisters, an attorney cannot get rid of the devil. <laughs> Are you with me, saints? Ah, glory be to Jesus. And so I want you to keep that in mind. 
Keep that in mind, brothers and sisters. This Christmas season, remain humble. Thank God. The Bible says this right here. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in what? Spirit. spirit. And when the Bible says poor in spirit, it, it, it means that you... As an individual, you, you, you have taken an inventory of yourself. Spirit here referring to the mind, not necessarily your spiritual life. I mean, you know that you have limited, it seems in the natural you have limited resources and you're humble. The Bible says you are blessed. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. That's what it's talking about. Not because people who are in the spirit are not poor. <laughs> ah, glory be. Are you getting what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? People who function in the spiritual realm, they have power with God. Amen. Yes. Yes. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Woo. I need to do so. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to take this to a close, but I need to jump. Let's go to, let's go to Luke chapter, before I bring it to a close. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Amen. And verse 44. From verse, let's read from verse 46 to 54. This is Mary. And, and this is wonderful. This is Mary after Elizabeth said to Mary. She said to Mary in verse 45, Blessed shall she be because she believed there shall be is blessed is she that believe for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the lord this is elizabeth mary went to elizabeth's house are you with me and elizabeth is in the spirit and elizabeth told mary you're gonna be blessed amen why because you believed anybody here believed because you believe there's going to be a performance of those things that were told of you by the Lord. Has God told anybody here anything? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. The Bible says then you're going to be, there shall be a performance. What you believe, you're going to see. That's why from this verse, what I got from this verse, I always say it, but I don't say where I get it from. I always say from this verse, if you believe it, you'll see it. Yeah, yeah. Don't wait to see it to believe it. No, 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 no. Right. If you believe it, yeah, because you got to see it. Believe is to see it first in, on the inside. Amen. Amen. If you can see where you're going internally, a way will be made. Yeah. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? If you see internally where you are going, if you have internal vision, a way externally will be made. I, I want to give, you know, I want to give. I want to give credit to the guy who said that, but one, one, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. It's not Les Brown. It's not, but he said this. He said, you cannot travel from within and stand still without. <laughs> he said, you cannot travel from within. And what he's saying, you cannot fortify your mind and remain the same place. Amen. Oh no, oh no, oh no. You fortify your mind, a way is going to be made. Because the Bible says, as a human being thinks in his heart, so is he or her. Oh, glory be to Jesus. So, so listen to what, because I'm, I'm, I want you to understand what God is doing. God is always. But be, be, before I get to that verse, let me show you God's. Can you go to Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9 to 10? Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. I'm, I'm on that humble. I'm on that humble. I want to stay with, with that particular train of thought. It's important this Christmas for you to see who you are in Christ and see how God is always rooting for the underdogs. Let me say that again. God is always right, rooting for the underdogs. Right here in Zechariah chapter 7, let's go to verse 9. It says, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, he's speaking to leaders now. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to leaders. He's speaking to the commissioners. Huh? He's speaking to, to the governors and the presidents. Call 
Congress. He said, what he said? He said, thus speak up the Lord of us, saying, execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his what? You know why we are all brothers? We all come from God. Amen. Let me say that again. We, are all, we all come from God, therefore we are all brothers and sisters. Yeah. Some of you just had to say amen. Let me think. Is that true? Uh, uh, it's true. It's true. <laughs> That's why the Bible says your neighbor doesn't have to be the person living next to you. Your neighbor is everybody in the world because we all come from one human being Adam and Eve. Oh God, I give you praise. Some of you will catch that sometime down the road somewhere. Verse 10, this is what verse 10 says and oppress not, there it comes, God's protected class. Oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, nor the stranger. Didn't I tell you last week, the stranger, that's on God's protected class, that's foreigners, are you with me? Nor the poor, four people from God's protected class, the underdog, God looks out for them. Are you with me, saints? He said, execute true judgment on them. Because he said, the poor, you'll have always. Some people, it's just the way it is. Some people will just not do. It, that's just the way life is. Brothers and sisters, from Jesus, Jesus said, you remember when Mary of Magdalia took, when she broke the alabast. The alabaster box. She broke it and the perfume in there cost almost $36,000. She took the box, broke it and anointed Jesus' feet. Because they didn't give him water to wash his feet. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had no respect for him. Typically, if the commissioners come at the house, if the governor come at the house, they would have water out of their doors to wash the governors and the commissioners' feet. Because they are the leaders. But Jesus, they have no respect for him. Because he didn't go to their cemetery. I mean seminary. Lord have mercy. I, he didn't grow up with their boys. He wasn't part of the group. Ah, glory be to Jesus. Because he knew who he was. When you know who you are, you don't join the bandwagon. So Jesus knew who he was. Oh, they knew he had anointing. He had an anointing on his life. But they had no respect for him. So they allow him to come in with dirty feet. All their feet are clean. And God touched that woman. Mary from Magdala, she broke the, birth, the, the alabaster box and she took the perfume and perfumed his feet. And then she took her hair. She had a ponytail. A ponytail, she had it wrapped up. She took up that thing. And she took that hair. And she began to wipe his feet. Take the dust of the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, mighty warrior, line of the tribe of Judah, our Jesus, our Jesus. Can somebody say, My Jesus, my King, my Lord? Oh, glory, I feel that, I feel that down in my sanctified soul. Glory be to Jesus. And she went down on her knees and she began to wipe his feet. And the Pharisees, the uppity, uppity up. Can you say the uppity, uppity up? The high mickety, mickety mocks straight on their way to hell. They began saying in their mind, if this man knew what type of lady she was, he would not allow her to touch his feet. And Jesus began to walk in the word of knowledge. He knew what they said. Glory be to. <laughs> you know, you're reacting better than you're reacting. You're not reacting like I'm preaching, so I'm going to move on. I think I'm just working up myself here. Let me. Let me move. Let me move on. Glory be to Jesus. Glory. One day you'll read it and you'll get excited about my Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. One day, one day, amen. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Woo! But but this is this is what because you see it was the poor and the widow and the fatherless who took care of him. Are you with me? And the stranger, glory be to God. They supported his ministry. Amen. Are you with me? Ah, glory be to God.
Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Now let me put a caveat in there. It's okay to be rich if you have the right heart. That's right. If you realize all things come from God. Ah, glory be to Jesus. And you got to give God his due. God loves everybody. Rich, poor. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. But I need, I need to show you this right here. What she said under the spirit. Amen. This is Mary. Mary said, can you go to Luke chapter 1? Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. And Mary said, my soul. You got it. Luke chapter 1 verse 46. I want to show you five. What she, she said, five. He hath. He hath. He hath. And all the he haths is pointing to what he has done for people who are low and meek. People who don't have a lot. Uh Are you getting what I'm saying? It's right in the Bible. But before that, she said, my soul Uh does magnify the Lord. Her soul. You know what the soul is? The soul is the mind, the will, and emotions. She said, my soul is involved. Some of us, we leave our soul at the house. Uh, uh, <laughs> and we come to church. Uh, <laughs> well, let me move on here. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? We just, every, just every, the only thing that's here is the body. I'm just here this morning. You know. why, why, why are they jumping that much in church? I thought that's all, be, I thought that's all, the, that's all the, they behave in the club. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. Wait when you go to heaven. Read about what thing happened to King David. Amen. Wow. And when I say I haven't seen anything here, let, let us get a full band and I'm done with music. Wow. Th- then you'll see what dancing is. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. In the presence of the Lord, Amen. there'll be some dancing going down. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> Are you with me? Let one more musician come to join him. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm here doing my boogie woogie for the Lord. Ha, glory be to Jesus. Yes, sir. When I come, I come with everything body, soul, and spirit. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. My mind magnify the Lord. My feelings, I have emotions for God. My will, she said, I have bent my will to let it worship God. And she said, my spirit. You know, your spirit, your born again spirit is always for God. It's always on God's side. She said, my spirit. What she said about the spirit. My spirit hath, past tense, it's a done deal. Hath rejoiced in God my Savior. There it comes. Five he hath. The first he hath. Four verse 48. For he hath regarded the law estate of his handmaid. Yeah. She called herself a bond slave. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, are you getting what I'm saying? A bond She decided to stay with her master. She has, she can go home. But she said, no, he's been too good to me. So let me take my ear and let them, draw, let them put an, let, um, let them put a nail in my ear and let me wear his ring showing that he owns me. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. That's a bond slave. She decided to do it. And the bond slaves, they held a special position. History shows uh, they hold a special position in the house of the master. They were not like every other slave. By the way, uh, let me, as I say the word slave, back then people sold themselves into slavery. Let me say that again. Some of you looking at God came into a corrupt culture. People began doing their own things. Amen. God didn't support slavery. Are you with me, saints? The reason I'm saying that is I met a guy and he's telling me, oh, the Bible supports slavery. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. Let us see what God thinks of slavery. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. Are you with me, saints? Oh, let me just take care of that before I move on here. Uh, It says, and he's giving a list of people who are going straight to hell if they don't repent. Mongers are going to hell. For them that defile themselves with mankind. That's talking about homosexuality. And lesbianism. Look at the next list. Men stealers. That is slave owners. Men stealers are going straight. Slave owners straight to hell. Now that, let me put a caveat. That's if they do not repent. Let me say that again. That's if what? How many of you know we're asking all of them to come here? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because if they come crooked, we'll set them straight. <laughs> we have the power of God, which is the power of love. We'll love on you until you get right. Oh, we'll tell you the truth in love. We have to stay with God. Are you with me, saints? Yes. Can we go back to Luke chapter 1? I, I think I made that claim. Amen. So when you make people who tells you the Bible suffered slavery, take them to that verse. Uh, Amen. Show them right here. Men steal us straight to hell if they don't repent. Amen. We got that clear? Yes. Praise the Lord. Let's continue here. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaid. Can you jump over to verse 51? Another he hath. You need to see all the... What, what I would encourage you to do is over the Christmas, look at all of these and read them. Meditate on them. It says here, verse 51, He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the what? Proud in the imagination of the hearts. Lord have mercy. You know, you know, <laughs> you know I'm just reading this right here. Oh, I just realized it's almost 55 minutes. I'm almost done. Lord have mercy. More than an hour. Sorry about that. Are you ready? I'm almost done. Three more verses. He hath showed strength with his arm. Verse 51. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Verse 52. Another he hath. He hath put down the mighty from their seats. And exalted them that are of. Lord, everything is about people who are humble. Think, let's read. He hath filled the what? Verse 52, 53, sorry. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he hath sent empty-handed. Let me say, God doesn't hate rich people. You know that. But sometimes rich people think they don't need God. And that's what, that's what it boils down to. Verse 54, and I'm done. He hath hoped. The word hope means to give hope. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Amen. A true Israelite, a true Jew, is not one who has circumcised. Are you with me? Outwardly. Because women cannot be circumcised. Praise God. A true Jew is one who circumcised internally, in the heart. A true Jew is somebody who has the spirit of God. Living in Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. It says in you we can cry Abba Father. Anybody who can cry Abba Father is a true Jew. That's why every day I say to myself I feel Jewish. I feel really Jewish. Glory be to God. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 it says and because you are sons and the word sons here is referring to the spirit in the spirit realm there is no male or female just sons. <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying. Abba. Can anybody say Abba? Abba, Abba means daddy. Yes. So during this Christmas season, I'm asking you since as I bring it to a close. To be thankful. Don't let your calamities define you. Don't let what's happening out there define you do not jesus said i have overcome the world and we are in christ so if he's overcome the world we have overcome the world and if you look into then you're not saved hallelujah if you're not saved pray this prayer with me so you can move from darkness into his marvelous light god we thank you see heavenly father i thank you for sending Jesus. <laughs> oh, glory be to Jesus. Born in Bethlehem. As your word says. Your word did not return void. Thank you for Jesus. I accept him now. As my Lord and Savior. I confess him as Jesus. My Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. For taking away my sins and for giving me everlasting life if you pray this prayer you just move from darkness into his marvelous light send us some information at iogmtally at gmail.com that is iogmtally at gmail.com we'll send you some information we'll pray with you and thank you for those of you who've contacted us amen 
Can you give the Lord a hand of praise? Can you give the Lord a thank you? Hallelujah. Please take time to meditate on the Word and let it sink into your heart and soul and mind today. Knowing that the Christian who meditates on the Word will be like a tree planted by the water, bringing forth fruit in its season and prospering in all that he does. But what if you aren't a Christian today? What if you don't know if you're bound for heaven as a forgiven child of God? If that's you, then let's take care of it right now if you're ready. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Are you ready to be forgiven of your sins and washed clean and made new? Are you ready to begin your new life in Christ? Then turn to God right now and say, Lord, I love you. I need you. I repent of my sins. Lord, please forgive me and wash me clean. I receive your forgiveness right now as I put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. God, please lead me and teach me and show me how to live from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you're looking for a good church family, you'll be welcomed with open arms at Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee, located at 4750 Capital Circle Southeast near Tram Road. Sunday school begins for all ages at 10 a.m. and the morning service begins at 11. And the Wednesday evening service begins at 7. This is a life-giving, multicultural, multi-generational church where people of all races, backgrounds, and walks of life come together to worship, to be inspired in their love for God, to develop relationships, and to be empowered to live out God's purpose for their lives. Find more information on their website, imitatorsofgodministries.com, or call the church, 850-408-8496.